the quest to defund Planned Parenthood. More than 150 lawmakers ask the president to deny government money to abortion providers. A question of faith, a Catholic judicial nominee is under fire for his views on marriage. Religious freedom, what the new Secretary of State will do for the cause. And no bones about it, officials in England make a major Catholic discovery. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, May 2nd, 2018. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. A landmark pro-life bill is on its way to becoming law. In Iowa, Republican lawmakers have approved a measure that would ban most abortions once a fetal heartbeat is detected, usually at six weeks. One pro-life leader was inside the state house early this morning when it passed. At, uh, at 2.32 a.m., I was in the gallery uh, watching this historic legislation being passed in the Senate. So I was witness to that, and um, I felt very grateful that Iowans for Life and all the other pro-life organizations had a small part in seeing that pass. The proposal now goes to Republican Governor Kim Reynolds. She has not said publicly if she will sign it. However, her office says she is 100 percent pro-life. We're tracking another pro-life story tonight, the battle brewing between pro-life supporters and Planned Parenthood. Some lawmakers are urging the Trump administration to slash government funding for the abortion provider. And meanwhile, Planned Parenthood is lashing out with a lawsuit. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. Planned Parenthood wants a judge to block the administration from shifting the focus to abstinence and natural family planning. The nation's largest abortion provider believes the Title X family planning policy would hurt its attempts to gain millions of dollars in federal grants. But that's just the latest in the fight over funding. 194 members of Congress are calling for abortion providers to be cut from a large pool of federal money. Those funds go to family planning for low-income Americans. And 80-plus pro-life leaders are adding their voice. In a letter to Alex Azar, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, they write, For far too long, the Title X family planning program has been integrated with abortion centers. It is time to act swiftly to disentangle abortion centers from the Title X network. The letter cites a report from the Government Accountability Office showing Title X funds supply 50 to $60 million to Planned Parenthood. That money makes up the abortion provider's second largest source of funding. It's beyond sad that the American taxpayer continues to fund the abortion business. Maureen Ferguson works for the Catholic Association, a group that strives to be a voice for Catholics in the public square. She signed the letter to Secretary Azar. In this instance, it's to speak up for the least among us, those 300,000 little babies that are losing their life every year in Planned Parenthood abortion centers. It's a national tragedy. Our taxpayer dollars shouldn't be funding it. Planned Parenthood is outraged with that proposal, writing in a tweet, this is unacceptable. Anti-abortion lawmakers and groups are pushing ideology so extreme that their domestic gag rule could essentially dismantle Title X, a program that 4 million people rely on. But pro-lifers say there are other health care facilities providing family planning needs besides Planned Parenthood. And they do not deserve one dime of taxpayer money. Today, the president and vice president met at the White House with the Health and Human Services Secretary, Alex Azar. He oversees the Title X program. I'm told they did not discuss the issue of funding today, but it's expected to come up in the future. HHS has taken up policies that favor pro-life causes. Lauren. White House correspondent Mark Irons reporting. Thank you, Mark. White House special counsel Ty Cobb is leaving his job. He will retire at the end of the month. The White House says Emmett Flood. A Catholic will replace Cobb. The veteran attorney represented Bill Clinton during his impeachment process. The Catholic League is accusing Senator Tammy Baldwin of discrimination after the Wisconsin Democrat blocked the judicial nomination of a Catholic lawyer. 
The watchdog group says her decision reached, reeks of anti-Catholic bias. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi is following this story. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. Uh, Gordon Giampietro is the assistant general counsel for an insurance company. He needs the support of both of his home state senators for his nomination to go forward. And Senator Tammy Baldwin says she won't back him, in part because he criticized the Supreme Court rule ruling redefining marriage. Children are best raised by a man and a woman. Liberal groups use Gordon Giampietro's Catholic radio commentary to oppose his nomination to a federal district court. He also spoke out against contraception. So when my husband rants and raves and about every problem in the world, and, it, and he, his answer to everything is, it was the pill, it was the pill. He's absolutely right. Yes, yes, because that's an assault on nature. Now, Senator Tammy Baldwin, a Democrat from Wisconsin, won't back him. In a letter to President Trump, she writes, he argued that the majority opinion in the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling should be disregarded because it's not really legal reasoning. This statement and others like it cast doubt on his respect for precedent. The idea that Gordon wouldn't be a good district judge because he's a good Catholic is insulting. Law professor Bob Destro taught Jim Petro, who went on to serve as an assistant U.S. attorney and now works at Northwestern Mutual. What we're seeing is the re-imposition of a religious test for public office. It's basically you can be a Catholic, you can be a Jew, you can be a Muslim, just don't think or act like one. Because if you actually say what you believe, then you're not going to be eligible to serve in a public office. Wisconsin's other senator, Republican Ron Johnson, tells me he fears the nomination is in severe jeopardy. And I am concerned that uh, she's withholding his support simply because Gordon's a person of faith. Liberals actually want judges that create law. He's a conservative jurist. He's not going to alter the law based on his personal beliefs. Baldwin's office is pushing back, saying three of the four individuals that Senator Baldwin sent to the White House for this nomination self-identify themselves as Catholic. So the claim that she objects to this nominee based on his religion is a completely false political attack. We're waiting to see if the chairman of the committee that oversees ju judicial nominations will hold the confirmation hearing for Gian Petro. They have for Trump appeals court nominees who did not have approval from both of their home state senators, but not district nominees like Gian Petro. Lauren. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi. Thank you, Jason. Five people are dead after a military cargo plane crashes in Georgia. The flight carrying National Guard troops from Puerto Rico went down near the airport in Savannah. The photo tweeted by the Savannah Professional Firefighters Association shows the tail end of a plane and a field of flames and black smoke along the side of a road as an ambulance stands nearby. President Trump makes his first visit to the State Department to see Mike Pompeo sworn in as Secretary of State. The former CIA director is promising to reinvigorate the department and restore its swagger. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reports from the State Department. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Secretary Pompeo says he's honored and humbled. He's also winning friends among religious freedom advocates who hope he will stand up for minorities around the world. We need our men and women out at the front lines, executing American diplomacy with great vigor and energy, and to represent the finest nation in the history of civilization. I must say that's more spirit than I've heard from the State Department in a long time, many years. We can say many years, maybe many decades. It's uh, going to be fantastic starting. There. The president's comments suggest morale has suffered under Rex Tillerson, who was fired in March. Religious freedom advocates hope Secretary Pompeo will pay attention to the plight of religious minorities around the world, a problem which some say has been ignored at the State Department in recent years. It's simply a sense that it's irrelevant. It doesn't have anything to do with what we do in American foreign policy. And that is about as uh, boneheaded an idea as I could possibly imagine in a world that is highly religious. Dr. Thomas Farr, a longtime religious freedom scholar and a Catholic, says a critical moment was when the U.S. government's recognition of a Christian genocide in the Middle East in March of 2016. But Farr says much more needs to be done. Dr. Farr also tells me the role of ambassador at large for international religious freedom is an important position in the State Department. Currently, that position is held by Sam Brownback, a Catholic convert. Farr hopes Ambassador Brownback and Secretary Pompeo will work closely together on international religious freedom issues moving forward. Lauren. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting from the State Department. Thank you, Wyatt. 
A caravan of Central American migrants seeking asylum in the U.S. captured the world's attention. But their next steps will unfold out of public view. The process of asking for asylum is a slow one. A group of around 150 migrants reached the U.S. border this week. 28 have begun the application process through the courts. 11 others face illegal entry charges. The rest of the group is still at the border. At least 16 people, including one Catholic priest, are killed in the Central African Republic. Armed groups targeted a church, mosques, and health facilities in the capital city. The deeply impoverished nation has faced deadly interreligious strife and infighting since 2013. Cardinal George Powell will stand two trials in Australia on sexual abuse allegations. The cardinal, on leave as the Vatican's finance minister, is out on bail until later this month. He has pleaded not guilty. The court dismissed about half of the charges. Three whistleblowers in Chile's sex abuse scandal urge Pope Francis to transform his apology to them into concrete action. The Pope um, was truly sorry about what he uh, told me. I felt also that um, he was hurting, um, which for me was very um, solemn. The three men spoke to reporters after spending five days with the Pope in the Vatican. They say they hope to see an end to what they call the epidemic of sex abuse and cover-up in the Catholic Church. This year marks the 25th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the Holy See and Israel. Israeli Ambassador Oren David works with Pope Francis and Cardinals to improve dialogue between Catholics and the Jewish people. Our Vatican correspondent, Juliette Lindley, sat down with Ambassador David. We are proud of the situation of the Christian community in Israel. It's quite unique. It's unlike any other country. Definitely it's in contrast to what's going on around us in countries in the Middle East where Christians, from which Christians are escaping. But it's even uh, unlike in other countries uh, in the world because Israel is among the few countries in the world where the Christian community has skyrocketed since its foundation. foundation. In 1948, when the state was established, the number of Christians was 34,000, end of 1948. Now it's 170,000. It's now 25 years since the Holy See and Israel have bilateral ties. What role can the Holy See um, make? What contribution can it give to peace in your region? Well, it's the encouragement of peace, uh, giving it its uh, spiritual support, which is of importance. President Trump has decided to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. At the same time, Pope Francis is calling for the international status of Jerusalem to be maintained. How much weight does a statement from the Pope have how much does his opinion count? Look, uh, Jerusalem is, is, is the capital of the State of Israel. It's been the capital of the State of Israel, and it will be the capital of the State of Israel. So in this respect, the president move is logical, rational, and uh, appreciated. You are the ambassador to the Holy See yes. for Israel. Can you give us some insight into your daily job here? Well, of course, it's part, it's part of my job to, to, to update the Holy See, uh, to draw the Holy See attention to our position and uh, to realities uh, on the ground. We live in unique times. We are fortunate in this respect that relations uh, between uh, Jews and Catholics are as they should be. Uh, acknowledging uh, what unites us and we are united by the same root, biblical root, by the same virtues and values which we share. We live in a golden age when it comes to relations between Jews and Catholics. Your Excellency, Ambassador Oren David, Israeli Ambassador to the Holy See, thank you so very much for talking to us. Thank you, thank the you. pleasure is mine. Thank you.
The Knights of Malta, a 900-year-old lay order, elects a new leader. Italian nobleman Giacomo Dalla Torre is Grand Master for Life. Pope Francis ousted the previous leader in January. A scandal involving accusations, the group distributed condoms, sparked that crisis. Coming up, a retail giant helps return ancient artifacts to their rightful home. Io rinuncio e io credo. Pope Francis says we have to make a choice between serving God or the devil. At his weekly talk at the Vatican, the Holy Father says the devil divides, but God unites, and we can't please both. World leaders are reacting after Israel says it has proof Iran is lying about ending its nuclear program. Germany's leader Angela Merkel says the nuclear treaty with Iran should be preserved, but she wants to see information behind Israel's claims. The deal was signed in 2015. It is set to be renewed or scrapped by May 12th. Joining us now is Blaise Mistal, Director of National Security at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Welcome back to the program. Always nice to be with you, Lauren. The architect of this deal, former Secretary of State John Kerry, plus other analysts are saying that this proof means that the deal should stay intact. Is that the right way to go about it? Well, certainly we know that Iran has cheated on past agreements, it has lied, and it has sought to build a nuclear weapon. All of that means we need to have the most stringent inspections possible. The question is, is that what the deal gives us? And the supporters of the deal would say yes. The critics of the deal, however, say you know, it's all nice and well that at places where Iran lets us, we can put cameras and watch them 24-7, but there's still places inside Iran that our inspectors just can't go. Government facilities. Government facilities, military bases, mm -hmm. where we think that some of this work that Prime Minister Netanyahu showed yesterday happened. And so we can't go check and see if it's still happening or not. And so if there's places we can't go, the inspections just aren't good enough to control a cheating regime like Iran. Therefore, then we should get rid of this deal and start another one. Tell me, why is Israel doing this right now? Why did they do this big dog and pony show where there was a big words on the screen that said lies? And then we saw um, him, I think we have the video, that we saw him right here pulling down the curtain on all of these documents. Is this because... Why is this? Is this because he's trying to help President Trump with his agenda? Well, there, there's three things I think that, that need to be understood to go into this. First of all, Israel feels like it is at the, the, the ground zero of the Iranian threat. If they ever get a nuclear weapon, if they ever decide to use it, Israel feels like it's going to be the one to go. They're the and, sitting target, right. And, 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 and Israel is small enough, that one bomb, and, 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 and they're toast, right? The second is they're actually locked uh, in an escalation between but with Iran right now over Syria. They've launched several airstrikes into Syria. Iran has retaliated against them. Uh, and so this is signaling Iran uh, uh, about that potential conflict. And the third is, is this May 12th deadline that President Trump has set to decide what to do with the deal. Uh, and this is giving him a uh, reason and cover if he decides to, uh, to scrap the deal. What, what, what impact will the information have on President Trump, however? Well, I think as most people have pointed out, a lot of the information, at least about the fact that Iran had a covert nuclear weapons program, that it was trying to hide it, uh, is information that the U.S. and other countries already had. Um, so there's not a lot of new information here. So I don't think it's going to tip his hand one way or the other, but it gives him a good excuse if he decides to get rid of the deal. What about Angela Merkel and all other leaders? How will this affect our relationship with them? You know, I think that's one of the, the most difficult questions here, and we saw the, the French President Macron and, and Chancellor Merkel here last week, and that's clearly relationships that, that the U.S. is trying to maintain as it goes forward. So I think there's a clear preference for working together with them, uh, but there's also, as President Trump says, America first. If he decides that the deal is not in our interest, uh, he's going to scrap it and then pick up the pieces later. Thank you so much for joining us, Blaise Mistal, Director of National Security at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Thanks for having me, Lauren. Immigration officials returned thousands of ancient artifacts seized from Hobby Lobby. The arts and crafts chain, owned by Christians, agreed last year to pay a $3 million fine to settle a lawsuit over its role in the smuggling of the objects from Iraq. They include ancient clay tablets and seals. The Oklahoma-based company says it has learned from its mistakes. 
Up next, crosses in German buildings cause controversy. And a surprising discovery in a recycling bin. Pope Francis sends a message to young people through his social media. The Holy Father posted a photo on Instagram and said, quote, the church counts on you. Always be generous, courageous, and full of hope. A Catholic leader in Germany criticizes the decision in the state of Bavaria to hang crosses in all government buildings. He says it will cause division. Cardinal Reinhard Marx tells the UK Catholic Herald, the cross is, quote, a sign of opposition to violence, injustice, sin, and death, but not a sign of exclusion against other people. Bavaria's governor says the policy reflects the state's Christian roots. Joining us now is Martin Rottweiler, General Manager, EWTN Germany. Great to see you. Welcome, Lauren. This issue has caused a controversy, and the apostolic nuncio to the neighboring country, Austria, did not refer to Cardinal Marx by name, but he said, quote, he was saddened and ashamed that when crosses are erected in a neighboring country, it is precisely the bishops and priests who criticize this decision. What is the reaction in Germany? I mean, it's a the reaction is controversial, but many naturally are opposed to that decision of the Bavarian government because we are a secular country and they think we are kind of uh, imposing the Christian faith or the Bavarian government is imposing the Christian faith onto the people, which is not the case. And on the other hand, naturally, people are also in favor of that to say, OK, finally, uh, we have this Christian identity. We have this Christian culture. Our society is based on the Christian faith, and even the uh, preconditions of a democratic society is so. So this controversy will go on for days and maybe weeks and maybe longer. Crosses are already installed in public schools and in courtrooms. So adding them to administrative buildings doesn't seem like a, a, such a leap. Maybe it's because, I mean, this kind of vacuum of identity that uh, the Bavarian government wants to fill and say, OK, we make a clear statement. Uh, and maybe also inside of the elections that they expect in Bavaria in October. So it's political. It's not only political. It's all, it's always has a political aspect if political politicians are involved. But I think it's really a question of now let's go back and let's look and find our identity because we have a big cultural discussion here about the identity of Germany and of uh, yeah our Christian roots here. The German bishops are also split over whether non-Catholic spouses can receive Holy Communion. And Cardinal Marx is heading to Rome to be part of a group meeting at the Vatican to talk about it. How is this issue viewed in Germany? I mean, they receive it also in a controversial way, in a different way. Some who are in favor of it think that this is kind of an opening, a widening of what the church did before and allowing uh, Protestant spouses of uh, mixed or interdenominational uh, couples uh, to receive communion now. Uh, others are naturally very much concerned uh, about the doctrine. And this is uh, the case naturally, especially of the seven bishops that sent a letter to Rome that they say uh, doctrine is at stake here. It's not just a pastoral issue. Martin Rottweiler, thank you so much for joining us. General Manager, EWTN Germany. Thank you, Lauren. The Archdiocese of Concepcion, Chile, begins construction for a greenhouse that will give jobs to young people with Down syndrome. Vegetables will be raised using organic methods, and the inspiration for the project came from the Holy Father's letter, Laudato Si, about caring for the environment. For more on this story, you can visit our partners at catholicnewsagency.com. And finally tonight, an environmental waste company in Britain makes a nearly two thousand-year-old discovery. Workers found a bone of St. Pope Clement. It was unearthed during a routine collection in central London. The company is asking the public to help find an appropriate final resting place for it. St. Clement was born in, was the fourth pope in the history of the church. He died in 110 A.D. That does it for all of us here at EWTN News Nightly. To all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Let's keep in touch online. You can follow me at Lauren Ashburn on Twitter and Lauren Ashburn EWTN on Facebook. Good night and God bless.